Welcome to First Presbyterian Church here in Athens, Ohio. We're pleased that you're worshiping with us on this Baptism of the Lord Sunday. We gather together this day to worship God, to celebrate the beginning of Christ's ministry as he goes down to the Jordan, as he is baptized by John the Baptist. And so let us join together in our call to worship. In the beginning, God created the world, and God blessed it. It is good. In the beginning, God created light and blessed it. It is good. In the beginning, God created life, and God blessed it. It is good. Since the beginning, God has not stopped creating, calling us closer to all that is good. We not only gather to give God thanks and praise, but we gather confessing our sins, both individually and corporately. We do so trusting in a God who forgets, who forgets our failures, our mistakes, a God who forgives. And so let us pray. Loving God, we confess our tendency to focus our world on our individual self. We miss the opportunities you bring before us to remember our collective history, to connect with our community and to learn from one another. As John prepared the way for Jesus and Jesus makes a way for us, help us find joy and strength in the connection of community. For this faith journey is one we cannot do alone. Amen. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven.
Hi, my name is Miss Nana, and I'm so glad you're watching this morning. Sometimes when we meet a new friend, we say, what's new? It's been a couple of weeks since Christmas, so if I ask you what's new, you probably have a lot to tell me. I'm sure you'll tell me about all the new things that you got in, like toys and all the new games, and I bet you spent hours playing with all the new toys you've gotten from Christmas. What I really enjoy is new beginnings. And we are at the beginning of a new year. Isn't that exciting? It's a chance to start over. It's a time where we can do better than we did last year. That's what our story is about today. New beginnings. But it's better than the new year. It's about new life new life in Jesus. In the Bible, we read about a man called John the Baptist. John lived in the wilderness. His clothes were made of camel hair with a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and honey. John went all around the countryside of Judea telling people about a new beginning they could have. He said, repent. That means to ask God to forgive your sins, turn away from those sins, and try again. People from all around went into the wilderness to hear John preach. John baptized people who repented. He did it in the river of Jordan. They were baptized to show the world that God had forgiven their sins. This was a new beginning for them. Even Jesus himself went to John the Baptist and was baptized by him. Just as Jesus was coming out of the water, he saw the heaven open up and the Spirit come down on him like a dove. And we still baptize people today. And that's what it call a new beginning. Let's end in prayer. Dear God, thank you for sending us Jesus, the one without sin to wash away our sins. Thank you for this new life and new beginning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And until next time, bye-bye. Our first scripture reading today comes to us from the book of Psalms, a reading from Psalm 29. Listen then for the word of the Lord. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders, the Lord over mighty waters. The God of glory thunders, the Lord over mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord causes the oaks to whirl and strips the forest bare. And in his temple all say, Glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. And our final reading today comes to us from the Gospel of Mark, reading in the first chapter, verses 4 to 11. Listen then for the word of the Lord. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism for the repentance and the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him. 
and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. May God add understanding to these readings from God's holy word. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh Lord, startle us with your truth this day. Remind us once again of your claim upon our lives. That through the waters of baptism, we have been made part of your family. Called to live in harmony with each other. And with you. For this we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. If I asked you to describe the sacrament of baptism, what adjectives might you use? Beautiful, solemn, ancient, holy? Maybe you'd describe a carved wooden font like the one we have here in the middle of the sanctuary. Maybe you would Think about white christening gowns with lace bottoms. You would see squiggly babies and smiling family members. But would my question prompt you to use the word wild? As in baptism is one of the wildest things that we Christians do. Has it ever occurred to you that this watery, 2,000-year-old ritual of the church is wild? On this first Sunday after Epiphany, the lectionary invites us to witness Jesus' baptism, and in doing so, to reflect upon our own baptism. But the language the scriptures give us is not the language of church decorum, it's feral language. It's the language of the untamed and the unpredictable. The lectionary reading today from the book of Genesis describes a formless void and deep and impenetrable darkness that God creates from. It's not a polished basin of warm water that the Spirit hovers over. It's elemental. It's undifferentiated. It's brimming with risk. Our psalm, Psalm 29 today, meanwhile, conjures a God of storms, of flames, of mighty waters. This God thunders. This God causes the oaks to whirl. This God shakes the wilderness. This God thunders and causes oaks to whirl. In our reading from the New Testament, Paul baptizes a group of Ephesian disciples who suddenly break into language of prophecy that they never knew they could speak before. And then in our gospel reading from Mark, we read where John baptizes Jesus. And in that moment, the heavens are visibly torn apart and a spirit dive bombs out of the sky. The very voice of God fills the desert air. Why do you suppose these readings are put together for this Sunday? 
Why frame Jesus' baptism with these wild words, these untamable words? And by extension, our own baptisms in the language of wildness. Here are at least some of my thoughts on that. There's a wildness in the wilderness or in the margins. Mark's gospel makes a point of telling us that John the baptizer appears in the wilderness. That is to say, he doesn't conduct his ministry in Jerusalem. He doesn't conduct baptisms in the temple, the center of the religious life of the Israelites. Instead, he draws the crowds away from the center. He asks them to repent, to receive baptism there in the wilderness. In the wild. Astonishingly enough, the crowds respond. We're told that people from all over the Judean countryside and all of Jerusalem came out to be baptized by John. Think about that for a moment. John, the camel-wearing, locust-eating prophet, empties the city. Now, we're 2,000 years removed from that moment. And so it may be easy for us to miss the mass exodus that Mark is describing in this gospel reading. Jerusalem was the beating heart of Israel's spiritual life. The temple was the place where you went to meet God. There were rituals of purification that were already part of the devotional life of those who worshiped in Jerusalem. But there was something in John's message that compelled them to leave the center, to leave the time-honored traditions, to leave the religious epicenter of Jewish life, to go out into the wilderness for rebirth and nourishment. There must have been something authentic and fresh in this movement that calls them away from the center, that calls them away from the institutionalized religious life that they had been so used to. Whatever God was about to do necessitated their leaving the city. It was a disruption. It was a shift away from business as usual. I wonder if that resonates with us as well. Now, I'm not suggesting that genuine faith always necessitates us moving away from familiar institutions or familiar rituals, especially those things we cherish. But isn't it often the case that the most compelling and daring calls for justice, for truth-telling, for peacemaking, for healing, don't come from inside the institutions, but rather outside? Not from the official places, but from the ones on the margins. Haven't we also seen countless centers in our own cultural, political, and religious lives lose their prophetic edge? They become places of complacency or corruption or stodginess or fear. This past week, the epicenter of our own political life here in the United States was in peril by a mob that broke windows, spray-painted walls, ransacked offices, left threatening notes. Two pipe bombs were found outside the DNC and RNC local offices. A cooler of Molotov cocktails was discovered in a parked car. Members of both houses were ushered into safe locations for their well-being, knowing that their very lives may be at risk. Many in our nation are still shaken by what happened. And the attack resulted in four deaths. Haven't we heard new voices speaking to us from the wild margins in unexpected places, calling us to repentance and renewal? How close have we come to losing our cherished democracy? I think there's a reason that Jesus is baptized in a wild place. There was need for reform in Jerusalem. 
There was need for repentance in Jerusalem. And so the voice begins on the margins, far away from the safe, the routine, and the familiar. And if we want to follow him in our own baptisms, we too need to listen to those voices that cry out in the wilderness for justice, for truth-telling. Recognizing that the hopes we have for our children and our grandchildren and for each other involve kindness and love and mercy and understanding. We too need to leave the cities that make up our comfort zones. And we too need to allow a God, a wild God, to disrupt us. I think there's also a wildness in solidarity. According to the Christian historian John Dominic Crossan, Jesus' baptism was an acute embarrassment for the early church. It's evident in the unease we detect in all four gospel accounts. Mark keeps his version of the story as sparse as possible. Matthew insists that John tried hard to dissuade Jesus from even being baptized. Luke skips the identity of the baptizer altogether. And the fourth gospel doesn't even mention Jesus' baptism. And apparently what scandalized the early church was Jesus' decision to receive a baptism of repentance. Repentance for what? Wasn't the Son of God perfect, sinless, holy? What was the Messiah do doing in the murky waters of the Jordan? What was the Messiah doing aligning himself with all those sinners that had come down to the river's edge? Why did God choose that moment to call Jesus the beloved? Why indeed? Why did the Son of the Most High get in line for baptism behind the tax collectors and the sinners, the very folks that would sully his reputation? Why didn't he care about appearances, about disgrace, about guilt by association? Aren't God's children supposed to be above things, to keep ourselves pure and undefiled? Apparently not, because Jesus' first public act is an act of radical solidarity with all those that stood at the river's edge, an act of stepping into the shameful relationship with sinful humanity. Instead of holding himself apart, instead of protecting his own purity, Jesus steps into the same water we step in. And he wedded his reputation to our reputation, his destiny to our destiny. In his baptism, Jesus enters into the full, unwieldy messiness of our lives into the life of the human family. In one watery act, he stepped the whole story of God's work on earth and allowed that story to resonate with us mortals, with us earthly folk. And in our baptism, we vow to do the same in the wild waters of our own immersion, the own, our own sprinkling of water on our heads. We join our being to all beings, regardless of political affiliation, race, gender, nationality, sexual orientation, we throw our lot in with everybody. And if this doesn't startle us, maybe it should. To embrace Christ's baptism is to embrace the wild truth that we are united, that the voices of those that would separate us are the voices of untruth that we are connected to one another. Whether we like it or not, the bond that God seals by water and the Holy Spirit is truer and deeper than all other bonds. It makes a stronger claim on our lives and our loyalties than all other prior claims, race, gender, tribe, politics, preference, or affinity. It asks that we all bear the risks of belonging together. And that risk may hurt us. That risk means we might have to change. And that risk is that others might have to change because of us. 
It's not easy to honor that kind of staggering claim. But we don't have a choice. Has the church always done this well? No. But that's not because God's claim was somehow optional. Maybe it's because we've tamed baptism. We've turned it into something perhaps merely ritualistic. And the truth is, we cannot have the waters of baptism without the connectedness one to another. We cannot have water without kinship. We can't receive the sacrament without giving up our separateness. It doesn't matter one bit if we're non-joiners by temperament, because the very act of baptism is an act of belonging. There is a wildness in belonging, and it's uncomfortable, and it's painful, and it takes time, because any good relationship takes time, and it takes communication. We need to stop talking over and around each other and to each other. And finally, there's a wildness in God's geography. In a beautiful essay called Holy Water Everywhere, the Christian Century editor, Steve Thorngate, describes baptism as a sacrament that straddles both the locative and the liberative. We are baptized locally in a specific time, in a specific place, into the spiritual life of a particular community. It is one of my favorite parts of the baptismal liturgy when the entire congregation promises to tell that newly baptized the good news of Jesus Christ. And so it goes against a cerebral, otherworldly abstraction for the sacrament. It says, no, here in this place, in this time, you were baptized. And those that were witness to that have promised to tell you the good news of Jesus Christ. Baptism insists that this place here, this ground here, the water in this basin is holy. Now, at the same time that it's local, it's connected to this place, it also liberates us into the global, the universal, the timeless. The water of baptism is connected to all the bodies of water everywhere, which means we cannot contain or constrict the sacred within the walls of this church, within the walls of any denomination or dogma or practice. Baptism, Thorngate writes, creates its own map. It is not the local map that stresses boundaries and the dangerous unknown that lies beyond them, nor is it the globe that erases everything particular, small and nearby. And I think it's why the lectionary this Sunday gives us all four of these stories, Genesis and the Psalm and Paul's letter, to remind us of God's overwhelming power over nature and a story with the early church and Jesus' baptism. Because when he consents to be baptized in the Jordan River, he consents, consents both to the location, but also to the universal. He enters into a holy geography that includes the unformed waters of creation, the storied landscape of his poet ancestor David, and every font, pool, lake, river, and ocean of his followers from Paul onward. The spirit who hovered over the unformed earth at the dawn of creation is the same spirit that comes down to Jesus on the day of his baptism. It is the same spirit that hovers over all of us today. The Lord who thundered over the mighty waters, who sat enthroned then, sits enthroned now. The God who loosened the tongues of those first century believers to speak the truth is the same God who raises up prophets today. In other words, the geography of baptism is vast. It spans all time and all places. It is far too large and far too wild a thing for us to tame or control. During this time between Christmas and Lent, we are invited to leave the miraculous births, the angel choirs behind, 
and we are invited to seek the love, majesty, and power of God in the ordinary things of life, rivers and voices and doves and clouds, holy hands that cover ours, inviting us into the baptism of repentance and new life. And in the gospel stories that we'll read this season, God will part the curtain for brief, shimmering moments and allow us to look beneath and beyond the ordinary surfaces of our own lives and catch a glimpse of the wild and the extraordinary. This is, of course, another way of describing the sacrament of baptism itself, a place and a moment where the extraordinary wild of God's grace blesses the water that washes over us. May we during this season and always join Jesus as he stands in line at the water's edge, willing to immerse himself into shame and scandal so that the wild wonder of God might be revealed to us. That God enters the messiness of our lives, whether it's political upheaval waiting for a test result, a family feud, that God enters into all of that and seeks to redeem it. May we too hear the delighted voice that tells us who we are and whose we are in the sacrament of baptism, even in the wild, untamable water that we stand in. May we know today that all of us all of us are God's beloved. Amen. As we gather in a time of prayer, as we think about the events of this past week in the life of our nation, as we think about members in our congregation who have undergone tests or who've been hospitalized recently, who've managed to be able to come home. We're grateful for the caregivers and the ongoing care that they have been receiving. I'd like to share a few words from a prayer from a friend of mine, Neil Pressa, who was here a few years ago when he was moderator of the Presbyterian Church. As he thought about the events on Wednesday, leading us into our prayer for this coming Sunday. And so let us pray. Holy and righteous God, our nation is simmering, boiling over with anger. We've seen this explode into destructive words and deeds. Lord, hear our cry. Lord, plead our cause for justice. Help us as a nation and as a church to reckon with the truth, past sins that feed present tense iniquities and fuel future transgressions. And forgive our complicity. Give us Jesus-sized wills and the Holy Spirit to pray for our enemies, foreign and domestic, to love neighbor and stranger because we know God of our salvation left on our own. We cannot do it. Gird us with strong knees to kneel in prayer and courageous hands and feet to challenge the pharaohs and the Caesars who seek to subvert your love and the ways of your kingdom. Grant us wisdom to discern your way, O God. Courage to speak your word and grant us your guiding light and a shepherding presence for the facing of this hour. For indeed, O God, you grant us the breath of life and you baptize us with water and the spirit. You bestow our identity as your beloved people of faith who belong to Christ Jesus. And we thank you for claiming us as your children, for directing us to your task, for humbling us in our strength and consoling us in our weakness. We praise you for that unconditional love that frees us to honor not only ourselves, but all your children as people of divine worth. And just as you entrusted Jesus with the mission to give his life for others, so you have called us to serve, working for the welfare of our brothers and sisters. Strengthen the efforts of all who seek to aid those who face the daily challenges of health, 
due to COVID. Be with those first responders, nurses and doctors, all those who put themselves in harm's way each day. Use us and shape our society, O God, that indeed we may look to a future filled with hope and not give in to the fear that leads to destruction and dismay. Comfort, O God, all who mourn the loss of loved ones this day. All who mourn the loss of those who lost their lives on Wednesday. For your impartiality, God of all, transcends all of our differences. And we pray for your healing and reconciling love wherever alienation, hatred, wherever any of that threatens lives. Guide the political leaders of all nations toward harmony, toward a shaping of the world which especially cares for the most vulnerable. Bring peace and wholeness. For we need your healing in our broken world, O oh God. And all of this we lift up to you because we know that you care for us. We know this because through your son, Jesus Christ, you stepped into the rivers of our lives. And you got money with us. And so hear us now as we pray together the prayer that he taught, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
And the last hymn we just sang, one of the hymns from the New Glory of God hymnal, there are these wonderful lines, so it is with the Spirit of God, making worlds that are new, making peace come true, bringing gifts, bringing love to the world. May the blessings of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with all of you now and forever. Amen. Thank you.